I, you know, I never know what to expect because they, they, they can ask all sorts and it, was, it surprises you sometimes. Yeah, surprises you what people think of, I know. Yeah. Um, but it was nice to see, you know, what, um, one other thing I just want to say before we, before we get going. It was nice to see, um, you know, you getting so much respect and, and everything for your achievements and, and everything like that. And what I mean by that is there was people coming in on there from like America and there's people coming yeah. in from like all different places. And it was just, I know you get a lot of that anyway, but it's just, it's nice to see it coming in. It's, it's nice to have, have a fan base like I, you know, especially when I was fighting, but to have, you know, it's, uh, it means more to you really, you know, because you, you know, you, I am boxed for like 23, 24 years. So um, it shows how much you are appreciated and thought of. And yeah, it means a lot, a lot to you. Thank you for watching. Today I'm with Robbie Regan, former WBO Bantamweight World Champion, former IBF Interim Flyweight Champion, um, and WBO Flyweight World Title Challenger. Robbie also held a number of regional titles, including the British title twice, the EBU European title twice, and the Welsh title. Uh, all at flyweight and we're going to be having a chat about Robbie's life his career uh, some of what's happened after boxing and today we've also got some fan questions that uh, fans of the sport and fans of Robbie have sent in um, from all over the world these are questions they want to ask him uh, so we'll be putting those in there as well so Robbie thank you for um, taking the time to to have a chat with me today thank you Liam it's a pleasure a pleasure to be here excellent okay so, like I was saying, I mean, obviously, uh, obviously, we, you know, we've had some fantastic questions from the fans. Um, like I was saying to you just now, I'm very happy with, you know, with the amount of responses um, that we got. So, I'm just going to start with with a few of those questions. Um, people have come up with some some excellent stuff. Um, people have come up with some really good uh, material there. So, one of the first questions, it's a good one to start off with. Um, Jay Eggleston, who's a well-known uh, bare knuckle boxer. Uh, up Sheffield Way has asked you what your toughest fight was in your career. So let's start there. What was your toughest fight? Well, you know, um, all the title fights are tough, you know, um, championship fights, you know, over 12 rounds, so they're long fights, so they're all going to be quite tough. But um, obviously fighting for the world title and uh, boxing fighters who are world class of that calibre, you know, they're all going to be tough. Um, my first world title challenge, I had so many problems going into that fight. Um, I know I'm making excuses for losing the fight. Um, the best man won on the night, but uh, if people knew the truth and how I, how I was treated before that fight, even my worst critic couldn't couldn't criticize me too bad, and would understand why I was defeated. But I give all the credit to Jimenez, you know, for being being victorious that night. But uh, you know, if if people knew how I was treated, it's, you know, it's quite disgusting, and um, uh. Uh, it's quite disgusting, and you know we never boxed Rob Regan on night. He boxes Shadow, but it, you know that made me angrier. You know, um, I know I knew in my own ability that I'm good enough to be world champion, and I proved that in my next two fights. Sometimes you never know how good a fighter is until he gets beat. It's not how we get beat, but how he comes back. Yeah, that's a that's a test of a champion, isn't it? You know, yeah, you know, and then knocking out um, Ben Jedo to win the IBF title. And then coming back and beating Jimenez, going up two weights to Bantam weight, um, beating Daniel Jimenez, who uh, who come over here and defend his title, I think it was three times. He took the Super Bantam weight title off Duke McKenzie. Um, he beat a very good fighter in Duke Dockerty. And uh, he also he also defended his title against another British boy here, so he was used to coming here to win in. Excellent, okay. So we've got another good question here from uh, Steve Boxer James, who asked, um, how old you were when you first started boxing? And also, did you always believe that you would be world champion? Yeah, well, I remember Steve, because when I first went in the gym, I was nearly 15. And Steve was one of the pros in the gym. He's a very good fighter, Steve was. And, you know, and I thank him because, you know, he's one of the, one of the pros there who, who, who would help me and, you know, when I was sparring with him, he would show me things. And, um, you know, and as soon as I walked in the gym, and it was, you know, I, I just, it just felt so natural to me. And, you know, obviously, your dream then, your first dream is to win a Welsh Press and represent your country. And after you won, I obviously, you want, you want to go on to bigger and better things. And I think it was, uh, and then when I turned pro, my ambition was to win the British title. 
and as soon as I, you start dreaming of European and world titles. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it goes up and up with the ambition. I, I understand. It makes sense. And then another another excellent question that that I really liked um, comes from Martin Williams. Uh, I'm just checking the names. But yeah, and he's asked where your will to win came from and how you sort of bounce back from uh, adversity, from setbacks. Because I know, um, you know, sort of expanding on that question, you know, you had some some um, very tough situations, you know, during your career and obviously afterwards. So, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. What has kept you going um, through situations well, like that? I don't know. I was just believing in yourself and your own ability, you know. I knew I was good enough to be world champion. Um and I said, when I lost that fight, I lost it for so many reasons out of the ring. And it, it just made me more hungry. And uh, it made me, made me um, you know, uh, wanted, wanted to win that title even more, you know, for myself and for my fans. And uh, another one here is, um, this is a good question, actually, from Bryn Newman, who asks, how come a fight with uh, Manny Pacquiao never happened? Now, obviously, you were... Um, obviously, Manny Pacquiao was flying through the weights. Uh, you know, you guys were around at the same time. Would have made for a, you know a fantastic fight. Um, and yeah, I mean, what happened there, basically? Well, um, Brian, I know Brian. Um, he was one of my ex sparring partners when I first started boxing from Mercer. Um, what a talented fighter Brian was! You know, one of the most naturally gifted fighters I've ever sparred with. Um, the Manny Pacquiao fight. Um, I moved up to bantamweight. And he was still a flyweight then. And when I was world champion, actually, Bant Manny was my number one contender. But as soon as he went to bantamweight, um, he, he basically went straight up to super bantam then when he was my number one contender. Um, so the fight could have happened if he wanted it. But um, obviously, Manny avoided me. Uh, I reckon so. He would have been in for a tough test. I'm going to throw in a question of my own there, um, following on from that. If you if you had a fought Manny, um, how do you think that would have gone? Who do you think would have uh, would have won that night? Well, I, I know, any, at, at my natural weight, you know, I, I can give the best an argument for the money. So you know, um, it wouldn't have been an easy fight either way. I mean, Manny is a legend in the boxing, but uh, he's a tough four. My best punch was a left hook. So, you know, who knows if I landed our left hook perfectly, who knows what could have happened. Uh, that's interesting. That is very interesting. And we've got another great question here, um, one that came into you from uh, from Ewan, is it? Uh, are you the only um, Welsh champion uh, that never got knocked down during your career? Well, yeah, as far as I know, yeah, I am the only Welsh world champion never actually hit the canvas, you know. It's, it's, I know some of our great world champions, I'm... Um, They've hit the floor, but you know, sure, good he was to get off the floor and win. But you know, one of my, my I think one of my biggest assets was definitely my chin. Now, how, how I could take a shot, you know, and yeah. you know, I bought, I bought some of the biggest punches who've been in, in boxing, you know, and they, they couldn't manage for me on the floor. And you no, know, it's, a, it's a, 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 my chin's an, an athlete I'm proud of. Absolutely. And there's another um, point here is at one point in time, um, Barry Jones, obviously world champion himself at uh, Super Feather, um, said that you're his favourite Welsh fighter, um, you know, of all time, basically, he, he said online. Um, what do you make of that? I mean, how does something like that make you feel? Well, uh, that's quite amazing because no, Barry wasn't just a, just a brilliant fighter, you know, he's a, he's a Sky Pundit now and he knows his boxing inside out. So for him to make them comments... Uh, about me is absolutely tremendous, you know, and uh, that means a lot to me. Okay, now I have a few questions that, that were sent in from uh, Xavier Wilson, who's a professional boxer uh, in America, who's had uh, 13 fights, 11 wins so far, he's doing very well. And he uh, sent in uh, several questions, actually, which, which I, I really liked. One of them is, um, he was asking about your camp routine, um, you know, what type of routine, um, you know, day-to-day -day routine, I mean, that, that you had in, in camp. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, what was your camp routine uh, actually like? Well, you know, I don't you know. My runs rose in the morning. I didn't go that early, you know. Any any time from 8 to 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be doing like a 10-mile run. And I'd be down the gym then at about 4, 4 o'clock for, for three hours. And then you just come, you go home then and have your food and, and rest. Because, you know, that's a big big part of training is rest. And 
to give give your body a rest so you can train just as hard the next day. Excellent. Okay. And another question, um, also from the from the same person, um, was how many rounds of drilling and fundamentals um, did you uh, would you do in a workout? Basically, how many Spar rounds of drilling and fundamentals? Yeah, yeah, well, I know I'd always do a lot of sparring, perhaps sometimes too much, but um, you know, um, I'd, I'd always have uh, four or five sparring partners, so they, they I'd be doing two rounds of one, and then the other one would be coming in fresh. So, you know, I'd be up against it all the time. And also sparring, one of my sparring partners, Steve Robinson, another world champion, who was a lot bigger than me. So it, it was great for me, you know, for, for the strength and conditioning to be sparring with Steve. I got him with my speed and, you know, he got me with, with the strength. Excellent, yeah. Okay. And another uh, another question that Derek Xavier asked is, um, you know, your thoughts on, fil on film study of, you know, watching uh, watching footage of... Uh, you know, fighters that you're going to fight or whatever, and your thoughts on on that? Do you, what do you what do you make of film study? Do you think it's well, I think you, should, you know it's a good thing to watch watch a fighter maybe um once or twice to, to just to know his style, but you know every fight's different. Um, you, I mean, if you when you're boxing in world class, you know you you can watch these boys, but they can change their style in so many ways. So you know you've got to be able to adapt to that, and you know you've got to be able to be able to box on the back foot and, you know, if you need to, to tough it out with the best some, you need to, need to tough it out. It's, it's just, you, you, you just got to have your tactics right for against these boys. And, you know, you got to be able to change your tactics in a fight. If, if them tactics ain't working, you got to be able to change it. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense. It's, it's a good insight into it, you know, and, uh, and obviously people who know boxing know that, but, yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, anyone... Who's watching? Who doesn't necessarily know so much about? Yeah, you, um, you've got to have plan A, B, and C. Yeah, that's a good policy. And the last question uh, from Xavier, because you know he sent four, was, um, and this is an interesting one: is do you think that boxing is lagging behind other sports in terms of the general IQ and agility levels um, that is applied at the base level? So, in other words, um, what do you make of the um, well, the preparation at at the base level, basically? If that yeah, makes sense. You know, um, boxing is one of the oldest sports in the world. You know, you've got to you've got to do the basics, right? You know, and you, you get them right, and you know, then you just got to give yourself every chance to win the fight. You know, and I, I don't think boxing is behind other sports because I, I think every sport, you know, I've got the, the grassroots level of training, and you, you know, they they got to be done whatever sport you're in. Excellent. Okay. Well, you know, they're great answers so far. I mean, unless it's what I mean that we, you know, we got some really interesting questions that I don't think, uh, certainly I wouldn't have thought of them myself. So it's, it's good to have different perspectives on it. Yeah. Now there's another one here from, uh, from Mark Andrews, um, who I also believe, you know, uh, and he, he has a, a lovely question, which is when you won your first title, your first uh, title, how did you actually feel and how did it feel to win your first title? Well, it's absolutely, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dream come true, you know. It's, a, it's, your, it's, your, it's been your ambition all your life. And then to get over that goal, it's, it's, it's just a dream come true. And, you know, when I turned professional winning, well, obviously winning the Welsh title, but, you know, my main ambition was to win the British title and the, to win the Lonsley belt outright. And once you've done that, you, you, you immediately dream of bigger and better things. Excellent. And one of the last ones, or actually I think it is the last one from the fans, is I had a question from Chris Evans, uh, not Christian Evans now, but a, a different Chris Evans, who um, said, after you beat Jimenez uh, for the world title, you were obviously you were diagnosed with um, glandular fever and everything. And he asked, were you ill um, leading up to the fight and what the situation was there? No, I, I was fine right up to the Jimenez fight. It was, it was just basically after he had a little layoff after the fight and I come back training. And, you know, I just wasn't right. And it, it took it took a few months before they found out exactly what was wrong with me. Um, it was a guy, who, a doctor who, who specialised in foreign blood disorders, found out that they had uh, glandular fever, which, which they diagnosed with them, steam bar, which uh, John Alumo had. Well, and that actually finished his career as well. So, you know, a big bloke like that, you can see how, how bad this virus is and how much it, it, what it does to people. Absolutely. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. 
And I mean, you know, that's that's a lot of the fan questions. Um, like I said to you before, I did have a few questions um, of my own for this that I think will give a good insight into, you know, different aspects of your career. Um, and, you know, they're, they're coming out well so far because they're different than, than your run-of-the-mill um, yeah. questions, I think. One of the... Um, one of the questions that uh, I wanted to ask you was, you know, in your in your actual entirety of your career, you you know, you had a lot of proud moments. Was winning the world title um, your proudest moment, or was there another moment that was that maybe sort of surpassed that in some way? No, nah, you, you know, winning the world title is the ultimate. It's the ultimate dream. You know, to do to actually achieve that is every dream you've ever had come true. But you know. Um, when I lost the title, British title to Ambo Four, when uh, on cuts, when he when he had butted me, I mean to get that to get that title back after the way he was taken off me, that that meant a lot to me. And you know, winning the European title against Salvatore Fani he was a very tough, very good champion. Um, you know, he showed what a man he was. And after he lost the fight, he picked my daughter up and gave her a kiss. So I thought, you know, what what a great guy he was. So I got different memories for different fights. Yeah. Now, you, you touched on something there, champ, that, that I'd actually um, like to go back to. Is you mentioned, obviously, uh, Ampo for, you know, your three fights with him, that you know, because you had three fights with him. I mean, did you see that as sort of a bit of a rivalry? Because obviously, you, you know, you fought him uh, in only your second pro fight and, and, uh, and then you fought him again later on for the British and everything. But did you see it as a rivalry between you or was it just business? Yeah, well, more business because, you know, I'm... Um... I knew and I always felt an old respect for Francis, but you know, I, you know, the guy wasn't in my league. You know, I was leagues about Francis, and I, you know, the proof that him what he went on to far bigger things and what he achieved. Mm. You know, but Francis won a British title, so it was, you know, he done well. Yeah. And the other one, um, you know, it's always a good question to ask is in terms of, you know, best performances. In terms of, you know, rating your own performances, having had. Uh, however long to look back on it now. What would you say your, your best performance in the ring um, actually was? Well, there's a couple of stick out really. Um, the Danny Porter fight, I mean, the boxer who said this was going to be a tough 12 rounder for me. He just lost uh, a, a close decision for the world title to Pat Clinton. And as I said, the boxer who said it was going to be a very tough 12 round fight for me. And, you know, and I blew, blew Danny away in three rounds. And obviously, to win a lot, when he won a lot, he battled outright against James Drummond. He'd, he'd just been robbed against Fanny for the European title out in Italy. Um, and he came to win, you know. And I stopped I stopped Drummond in nine rounds, you know. But he was a tough boy and he, he came to win. And obviously, winning the world title against Daniel, Daniel Limenez when he'd come over here, like I said, three or four times and, you know, defend his title. And and took the super bantamweight world title off Duke McKenzie over here. So he was, he was used to travelling to Britain and winning. But uh, he met his match when he come come to Wales. Excellent. Now you touched on something there. This um, it's another good thing to go back to is you know you mentioned about fighting in Italy and things. I mean, out of the you know the different places that you fought. Um, do you have a favourite? I mean, I know it might be fighting, you know, at home in Wales. That might be your favourite. I'm not. I'm not going to assume that, though. So I'm just throwing that out there. Where was your favourite place that, that that you fought? Well, well, you know, as an amateur, I box all around the world. You know, and I boxed in some lovely places: Canada, Norway, Sweden. Um, you know, Canada, Canada is a lovely place, a lovely country. You know, and the people, people, people are so nice there. But you know, but. Obviously, um, my fights at home was very important to me, and I was lucky enough, lucky enough to have the support that I had, and the tickets that, that, that I could sell that uh, I could get champions out of the country to, and I had to come and defend me in, in my own country. So I was a big advantage. Excellent. And another one is in terms of you know everyone you face. I mean, obviously through your career, you know, you you face some very 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 skilled fighters. You're in some very tough tests, uh, and you know, almost always came out on top. But, you know, is there one that stands out as like your most skilled opponent that you faced? Um, maybe maybe there's more than one, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say the two Jimenez is Alberto Jimenez was one of the hardest punches I boxed. You know, he had so many knockouts on his record. Um, he's an amazing fighter. I mean, I, everybody in boxing thought of him as the number one flyweight at the time. 
and you know he, he's an exceptional fighter. But you know, um, as I, I said, I, I felt he boxed my shadow on, on that night, and I would love to make my first defense of my bantamweight title against him, taking that off Daniel and as he showed what a good fighter he was. As I said, he have come over here many times defending his title, and I put him down in the eighth round. And you know he got up off the, off that, and you know he come back and show what a, what a good champion he was to last the distance. Mm -hmm. You know even uh, Marco Antonio Barreda, uh, he lost his Superman title to Barreda, but Barreda couldn't put him on the floor, and I managed to do that. So excellent. There was another one um, that just funny enough just came to me as you were saying that. But I've heard from from a number of champions I've spoken to, obviously that your life changes a lot after, you know, after winning the belt in, in certain ways. Um, some people have said, other people have said it, you know, it, it, it hasn't changed that much. But for you, after you become world champion and after you sort of achieved your dream, and I know there's, there's the, the tragic side of that, which we, which we will get to, but in terms of some of the positives first, though, how did your life actually change after, you know, after the world belt? Um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, you seem to get recognised more. Uh, more um, everybody wants a, your, an autograph or a photo. Um, but, you know, it never changed me as a person, you know, I've, I've always been, you know, just a local boy and, you know, I'm proud of it. Oh, that's good. And that, that does lead me to um, one other thing there is, is obviously you've obviously, I reckon, had, um, you know, a, a positive impact on your community. I mean, I, I would say so in terms of, uh, you know, inspiring people, you know, showing people you know, what was possible and pe people think, oh, you know, if, if Robbie did it, you know, maybe I can do it as well as young boxers and, and things like that. But, you know, what are your thoughts on, um, I mean, it's not really one question. I'm just opening up a, a, a big well, sort of... Uh, after I won the world title, I mean, I knew three or four local gyms and the trainers used to come up to me and tell me after, after you won the world title, my gym was packed full of kids I've never seen. So, yeah, it was a good impact, you know, um, it showed kids around you if you if you put the work in you can achieve what I achieved. And if you've got the ability. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So yeah, I mean let, let's touch on um, you know, the the one side of it now. Obviously, you know, failing the brain scan and, and your career being cut short and things. And I know you've talked about this a bit in, in, in a number of um different interviews and obviously it's it's a terrible um situation. But I mean, immediately upon, because I know there was obviously a period of time after winning the title where I, I believe you had a number of, of injuries and there was other things going on. But just just walk us through, uh, a lot of people watching this will know parts of the story, but for anyone who doesn't, just walk us through a little bit about what happened in terms of the brain scan and some of what went on there. Yeah, like, like I said, I was out for over a year now with, uh, with Lanza of Viva. And then, you know, I... I I got back in the training and I knew I wasn't right. I knew there was a problem. Um, but this fight was still going to go ahead. Um, I just done pre a press conference with Oge Ulio, a former world champion. And then I, I had the news then that, uh, that I'd, I filled an MRI scan. I went up for a second opinion straight away to London and they confirmed the same. So I knew then and then my, my career was over. You know, it was, it was the hardest pill I've ever had to swallow. And, I mean, did did they sort of explain what, I mean, was it like swelling on the brain or was it no, just... No, no, no. They did just to me, it was, uh, it was actually scar tissue, which probably been there for, for, for a number of years, you know. Um, I, th I think it was there on, on the, the brain scan before, but they never picked it up. And in terms of, obviously, your experience then, I mean, it's, it's, it's devastating news uh, to receive. I mean, I, I, mean, I can't imagine... Um, I mean, the only thing I would say is obviously, you know, at least you did achieve your dream of being world champion, which is better than that happening maybe a bit sooner. But it's still, it doesn't make it, you know, much better because it was cut short. So how did you... Well, absolutely, you know, um, if I didn't achieve my dream and winning the world title because I knew I was good enough, I think it would have hurt me a lot more when I second look back on my career and say I done it. So, you know, I, I, that gives me peace of mind. But... But they don't have my bank balance, you know. Is <laughs> you only get, you know, you earn the big bucks when you when you become world champ. Mm, that's right. Yeah, I know. So I mean, upon hearing, you know, that that sort of news, I mean, how did you respond to um, oh, it is, when you first heard it? Now, it hit me for six, you know. Um, 
I, I, I had to drink for, for a long time. I was depressed. Um, I think I was just self-medicating with drink. At the time, you know, I just, I needed help. And uh, there, there was no help there for me. I didn't know where, who to turn to, you know. So I just, it was just, I just turned to drink for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an hard hole to get out of when you're in that hole. But eventually I did. Well, there's one or two other things about this time. Now, just, just for your um, own reference, champ, I don't really want to dwell on yeah, some of what went wrong, actually, because I don't believe in that, because I believe that obviously people change. But the reason I'm bringing it up, just for your reference, is because if there's people going through something similar at the moment, so obviously you've been through it and you come out the other side of it, whereas obviously there's a lot of people who are probably still in that situation, you know, as we speak, right? Mm. So I'm hoping that by sharing some of this, it will sort of help those people. So, so that's the reason for, for it. But like I said, I don't want to dwell on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, One or two other things about well, it. Things have changed. Now times have changed. There is help out there for you. You know, go, if if you you think you need, if you just think you need help, go get it because there is help out there for you. Whether it's counselling or you know you need to see a doctor, maybe medication, whatever whatever they suggest. You know, you know, you got to help yourself. And but there are people there now. To, you know, there are people in these positions that can help you. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's come a long, long, long way. Uh, even in recent years, I mean, you know, in terms of um, you know mental health support, in terms of addiction support, in terms of even if it's not anything with a label, even if it's just needing someone to talk to. I mean, that whole idea has has come a long, long way, which is good. Well, going back to the question I was going to ask. I mean, obviously you. Um, it's well known that you were in prison, you know, you were for an incident that happened and that sort of went happened. Mm. I want to ask that from a different perspective, rather than dwelling on the incident. Your experience in, in the time you were in prison, were, were you um, treated differently in there as a, as a champion, as a former champion, or was it the same as, as everyone else? Or what, what was the actual experience like well, from that? Yeah, um, you know, I remember I went to an open prison. First they went to open prison and two young boys was reading, reading a local paper. And they read that I had gone to prison and they, and they were saying to each other, you know, I bet he'd be here with us because it was open prison. And I was standing in front of him and they didn't even know it was me. But when they realised it was me, then they, they just couldn't believe it. Like, you know, they wanted my autograph. Ah, oh, good, good. But, uh, you know, I, I, I like to just set the record straight bit for there because the paper said I went to a neighbour's house, but I didn't go to no neighbour's house. It was a house that I was renting that I owned that the, a guy was living there that shouldn't have been living there. So I wanted him out. And w when I went there to chuck him out, he, he went with me with a baseball bat. So so obviously I defended myself and hit him. And then I get jailed for it. And, that, and that's the truth. Yeah. That's what happened. Okay. That's yeah. what happened. Yeah, that's interesting because, um, well, like I said, I mean, oh, you know what? I, I'm not going to get into this because it's, it's off topic. Yeah, yeah. But the amount of times, no, but the amount of times the papers have... have said something about someone, not even in things like that, but in other things. And I've spoke to the people, even people that I know, if something's happened, and I've spoken, and they say it didn't happen like that, you know. Yeah. And, so, and and it's it's just, it's, it's a crazy situation. It's, um, and like just, I said, you know, they said I went to a neighbor's house. No, it was my house and house that I owned. Mm. You know, uh, they, if they're gonna write these stories, you know, the least they can do is get a fax, right? Yeah, well, that's right. But I, I suppose it's, you know, former boxer, you know, does something and it, yeah. it sells papers, doesn't it? You well, know, I mean, it, you know, yeah. yeah it's, it's big news at the time, isn't it? Yeah, well, it was. Like, yeah, yeah, I remember. And then, obviously, you know, you've you've come out the other side of, of these experiences. I mean, uh, the time, you you know, that you were in prison and things, do you think it changed you as a person? Do you think it helped you as a, as a person? Or was it just um, something you had to do to sort of... I said, no, I said, uh... Um, I you know I knew I should never have been there in the beginning, so so that was that was that was an hurtful thing. But you know, I, I think it just you know you make sure you never go back there. So yeah, so something good come out of it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Well, moving on from that side of things, I mean, obviously, you know, you've you've recovered um, in in a number of ways, and it's it's been a sort of a long road. Um, you know, from what I know of it, to to sort of recover from some of these situations with the drink and with that and with obviously. But now, you you know, things are going much, much better um, these days. And I know that that time in prison was, was a while ago, so it's been a while yeah. since. 
which is the other thing just to mention for anyone who doesn't know that, that you know there's been a while so since. I think it's 17 years ago now. yeah yeah so hence I said I didn't want to dwell on it but yeah, it's still sure. but it's still right. the ups and downs of you know the yeah, it's, like it's, it's what happened then is the truth yeah yeah so obviously you know in the years um since you know since you finished boxing and since some of these things happened I know that you've been um running uh, a local gym uh, as, as far as I'm aware and things like that but just give, for everyone watching this, give a little overview of um, some of what some of the highlights of what's happened since you know since you finished boxing, if that makes um, sense. You know, um, I had uh, I mean the, the gym I started, they actually sold the building, so so the trainers I I got in the gym helping the boys. We're looking for a new place now, so so these youngsters got somewhere to go. Um, on the highlight side of things have happened to me. Um, I had the twentieth anniversary. Of winning my world title, I had a I had a big night put on to me by my good friend Russ Morgan, in the Cafe de Paris in Monte Carlo to commemorate the twentieth anniversary, which was an amazing night. You know, I mean Monte Carlo is is just one of the richest places on the planet, if not the richest place. And and also I had a night in Cardiff to celebrate the twentieth anniversary for all the fans come. So I think that was that was the biggest highlight since I finished boxing. Excellent. And obviously, I've had you know two babies, so you know, it's like life, has been pretty good since. Yeah, oh, that's good to hear it, champ. That's good to hear it. And another thing um, about that is, I mean, in terms of sort of, um, I'm almost going down to, to plans from here because, uh, you know, I mean, do you sort of see yourself um, training people? I mean, I know you're doing like the more, or I mean, I know you're doing the charity side of things um, as well, which is, which is some really good work. Actually, let's talk, let's talk about that side of things first, because, um, you know, you're doing, doing some work with the um, uh, Ringside Charitable Trust with the, with the rest and recovery there. Um, let's talk a little bit about that side of things, because I think it's great work, and I think it, it, it should be, um, uh, I, I hope that, you know, this video will put that out there a bit more. So what sort of work are you doing um, with, with that charity side of things? Well, you know, there's a lot of charities that ask me for some stuff to, to, that they can auction off for different events. And can I go to certain events? Well, I'll turn up for them, you know, if, if it raises money for, for a good established charity. But obviously, the Inside the SK is my, my the biggest charity that I want to be involved with because it looks after Xboxes and the struggles they have if they've uh, been injured or fallen a lot of times. So, you know, I decided to put on this event from now as soon as I can, and obviously look at look to do other events and other other things in the future. Excellent, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to give that a mention, like I say, because I, I think it's 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 fantastic work that you're doing, and obviously there's a lot of boxes that that end up one way or another in in hard times, which you've obviously experienced yourself. So it's sort of good. I I just love the fact that you're sort of giving back and. Everything, you know. and there, was, there was some great champions involved with Ringside Rest and Care. You know, my great friend John H. Tracy, he's 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 one of the one of the, one of the people, one of the ex champions who who gives a lot of time, his own time, and there's so much for the, for the charity. Um, Dave Harris, who, who who started it, you know, the, these guys put in a lot of work, you know, and it's it's, it's great to see. Only, only a couple more questions that I have, really. Anyway. Um, to be honest, and one of them is uh, obviously, um, to, you know, just going back to the gyms and, and stuff a little bit and things like that. Um, I mean, just I know a bit about it. I don't know. I don't know loads, uh, to be honest with you, you know, with you there, champ. But with some of the work around the, the gyms and things, I mean, what sort of work are you, are you doing with that at, at the moment? Well, like I said, we've um, the gym that I actually opened, you know, they closed the building yeah. and they sell in the building. But apparently the people of Kem Forest, where it's at, they, they they've um started try getting between themselves and they they try and buy the building back. So you know if that if if we a bit of luck on outside and we get a building back, we we to go back in now and uh, keep going with the with the gym for the kids of the of the local area. Excellent. Okay. Well, fingers crossed. Um, fingers yeah. crossed. I mean, you know, yeah, I do think the kids need, you know, that type of focus. Whether you know whether they stick to boxing or not, it's good for them to have that sort of time of, you know, getting off the street. Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, at least it gets them off the streets. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, not, there's not much out there from no more, you know, the use clubs are my day and all that, it seems to have gone. So, you know, they, they need somewhere where they can go, even if it's just let off steam or even train, just a bit of training. If they, even if they ain't going to fight, it gives them, 
gives them a bit of focus. Yeah, yeah spot on, yeah. Uh, and the last question that I have really, Champ, to be honest, is obviously, um, you know, future plans, which we did, which we did touch on with, uh, with the charity side of things, I know. But I mean, over the next, um, however long, the next few couple of years or anything like that, um, you know, however long as you want to think of, really, what are some of your plans, some things you, you've got in the pipeline, dreams, ambitions, I mean, anything? Well, really? just, just, just crack it on, um, doing my comfort and say rest and care. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it, next year now will be the 25th anniversary when I won the world title. So we got two big, big nights planned for that. Or, or in the planning for that, with a yeah from my great friend Russ Morgan, um, yeah, yeah, who, who, who's my agent, uh, who have helped me in the past. He, he, you know, we're looking for to hold another night in Cardiff, which I which I look forward to. Excellent, yeah, fantastic. Well, you know, Champ, I mean, really, that's 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 a lot of you know good stuff that we've talked about, and it's you know it's a mix of stuff from the fans, it's some other things from you know from myself, and it's a nice, it's, it's a really nice insight. You know, before we sort of um, wrap that one up, I'm actually going to just turn it over to you because I just want to make sure, is there anything, you know, that you'd like to talk about specifically? Is there anything you'd like to say to people watching? Anything you're holding on to at all? Uh, uh, you... you know, um, I just, you know I, I, like I always said, um, uh, I always got a huge appreciation for my amazing support when I was fighting and now, you know, um, I, when... <clears throat> You know, I, I'm just glad I could repay the belief in me and win a world title from. Um, you know, a piece of my world championship belongs to each and every one of them. You know, they made my fight nights electric, amazing. You know, they give me memories that, I, that I'll keep forever. And I thank each and every one of them. Okay. Well, I mean, um, Champ, it, it's been, like I said before, I mean, it's, it's been a really, really good insight into your, into your career. And... Um, I appreciate you taking the time for it, really. My, you know, my aim for do, for doing this is 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 sort of two things, really. I mean, obviously, one of them is, um, you know, the inspirational aspect of it, obviously, of what of what you've come through, how you've bounced back, and so forth. And the other one is, of course, um, you know, it's it's good for you to keep getting the, you know, the respect, the appreciation, and and everything like that. Um, you know, even after years, which I which I know you do. Um, but you know it's good, and I hope that I've sort of put questions in there that are a little bit different to you. To yeah, yourself. it was a little bit different. Was, yeah, you know, because because yeah, a lot of you're a bit, you know, when you're like, asking the same questions all the time. I mean, most of the fans they just want to know what how much money you got. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's all they want to know. <laughs> yeah, 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 they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, oh, like well, I said, good three days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much did you win, but? Oh, uh, yeah. I bet you get that a lot, yeah. <laughs> but at least, you know, you made it to the top of the mountain and, right. and it sort of, it paid off in that sense, you know. And, um, yeah, I know. And I, yeah, it's, it's not always been easy since, I know. But, of course, um, there's a lot of a lot of boys who never get to, you know, obviously making it to that. Oh, you know, I so many fighters who could have been world champions they just didn't put the work in and who get the fighters who put the work in and the end just ain't good enough. You know, so, you know it's, it's hard. It's hard. I think it's the hardest sport in the world. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Hardest sport. But it's, I still think it's uh, the best sport in the world. Oh, it is. As I said, it's the hardest but most beautiful sport in it. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the rewards are, you know, um, you know, achieving your dream and all that is, is phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Everyone watching, after I spoke to Robbie last and after we finished the interview, Robbie had uh, a few other things that he wanted to talk about. And I'm glad he did because they're very, very interesting subjects. So for everyone watching, we'll talk about those uh, now in a moment. So Champ, I think one of the other things that, um, you know, that we didn't put in before that he wanted to put in was obviously um, your favorite fighters who you think the greatest fighters of all time are, and that's, you know, that's a very, very good question. So I'll throw that one over to you. Who do you think um, the greatest fighters of all time are? Well, for me, without a doubt, the greatest is Muhammad Ali, not just what he's done in the ring, but out the ring as well. You know, I just think, you know, he's just a fantastic man, whoever walked the earth. And, um, you know, there's no such thing as a, as a perfect fighter, but I, I think Sugary Robinson was the neatest thing to it for all Wrong fight, they could box and fight. You know, you, you, I think Ahmad Ali 
looks at him as as the greatest as well. Absolutely. absolutely. But uh, yeah, I know. Um, growing up, my hero like was Julio Cesar Chavez. I mean, he was ninety fights unbeaten, and he was fighting, you know, unifying world titles with with fight fighters and champions in a prime. And to go ninety fights unbeaten, that's quite incredible. Absolutely. Um, my favorite Welsh fighters probably Jimmy Wilde and Howard Winston. I mean, Jimmy was under eighteen fights unbeaten. Uh, he's voted the greatest flyweight of all time in the uh, Boxing Hall of Fame. And, you know, he was under 18 fights unbeaten, as well as the under the booze fights he had and, and, uh, that he won. Um, my, my other Welsh fighter is the great Howard Wal Welsh Wizard, Howard Winston. You know, he had a heart of a lion and his, his, his boxing skill was second to none. And other fighters I admired growing up was uh, like fighters like Alex Aguello, Wilfredo Gomez. Um, Sanchez and Carlos Zerat, all incredible fighters, and there's there's so many more that that uh, that I that I can't think of right now. But this moment, but there's 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 some great fighters in the history of boxing. Absolutely, absolutely. And just one other thing with that that's worth throwing in there is obviously in you know in your time in boxing and, and even up to now, you will have sort of met and and worked with some great champions as well, some some other great champions. I mean, in terms of experiences like that, is there like a favourite, um, you know, um, other champion that you've met or another boxer that you've worked with? Or have you ever been sort of starstruck meeting someone like, oh, wow, it's him type of thing? Did yeah, you, 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 you meet any of your, your, your heroes and favourite boxers at the first time you meet them, you know, you are, I was starstruck and I think, you know, most people would be. But I think uh, probably the nicest guy and, and you know, um, exceptional champion I've ever met, Marvin Agler. I mean, such a nice guy out of the ring and such a such a force in the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, my but my buddy uh, went with Lee because he was he was doing a dinner with Agla or getting Agla to do a dinner here in Wales, and my buddy but he tracked him down in Milan in Italy where he's living, and when he realised my buddy was Welsh, the first thing Marvin asked him was how's Robbie Regan. So uh, that's quite amazing to hear them kind of stories. Absolutely, yeah, it's amazing that is. It's amazing. And the other thing um, that I think, you know, that you mentioned to me that you'd like to talk about um, is, is your book, is the fact that you've got a book coming out, which would be very, very exciting for, you know, boxing fans everywhere, not just in Wales, but, you know, all around. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, like, about the book and everything. I mean, um, yes. you told me a little bit, but let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, it's being written at the moment, you know, and... Uh... I mean, nothing, nothing kept back, you know, and um, the facts are better than f fiction. You couldn't make it up, you know, my, my, my life and my story, you know, all the blood, sweat and tears, you know, it'll, it'll all be there and it'll, it'll be great read for any boxing fan or, or sporting fan, I'm sure. Yeah. So, and it's going to be, as I understand it, sort of your life from, from the beginning, you know, all the way through and, and all of your, that's right, Every, isn't it? Everything is there, you know, all the ups and downs, the highs and the lows. Um, this this is going to be quite a read, yeah. Excellent. Oh, that's good. Well, that, that's fantastic in itself because it's you know it's going to be really good to sort of read and uh, and, and you know and get into everything that you went through because you don't always hear it from from the champion's perspective. I'll, I'll be the first in line to um, get a copy. Champ, Thank you, you know. very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving my friend. I will honestly, but yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, like I say, I'm glad you, I'm glad you sort of um, contacted me to put those other things in because they're, you know, they're two very, very good, good questions, good points. Yeah, no, is is there any? Good. Sorry, say again. Yeah, go on, go on. No, I was just going to say, is there anything else? Is there any other things that, that you've thought of? No, I know I can think of it now. So, um, you know, obviously, as always, I'll always find my fans. Um, you know, they made my fight nights electric. You know, and a piece of my world title belongs to each. Wait, well, a piece of my two world titles belongs to each and every one of them. Okay. Well, once again, um, you know, thank you for your time. Um, you know, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Liam. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel, and there'll be more videos coming soon.